A little more than a week ago, Robert Mugabe, the only president most Zimbabweans had ever known, announced his resignation. Reluctantly. He did not jump. He was pushed by the military, and the overthrow sent Zimbabwe's media scrambling. Mugabe had held them in his grip for nearly four decades. Robert Mugabe came into power 37 years ago as a revolutionary anti-colonial force. The media landscape he inherited was tightly controlled by his predecessor, Ian Smith. It reflected the interests of the white minority. A transformation was in order. However, Mugabe did not reverse Smith's media policies. He adopted many of them, ending hopes of a free press. Journalists covering certain stories faced harassment, imprisonment, even assault by the authorities. There may be a new man in the president's chair now, but what that means for Zimbabwe's media is unclear. After all, Emerson Munangagwa was at Mugabe's side while all those journalists were being repressed. The Listening Post's Will Young now on Robert Mugabe's media legacy. It was evident right from the start of last month's military coup in Zimbabwe that the generals were following Robert Mugabe's example, strong-arming the media. In his last media appearance, Mugabe gave a speech flanked by military commanders. And material conditions. When he appeared to deviate from the script, the generals were having none of it. They had learned about media control from one of the most autocratic rulers in Africa, and they used that against him. Even as a revolutionary, Robert Mugabe understood the power of the media. While in exile in neighboring Mozambique in the 1970s, Mugabe broadcast speeches back into what was then called Rhodesia, calling for the end of white minority rule and positioning himself as a leader who could stand up to imperialism. The enemy we are fighting is not just Ian Smith and his regime, it is Ian Smith, the British, the Americans, the French, the West Germans, and the Zionists. After negotiating independence in 1979, Mugabe came home the next year to a hero's welcome. More than 200,000 Zimbabweans turned up to see a man whom they'd hardly seen for years, in person or in the media. The Rhodesian government had banned even showing his photograph. So this mystical figure. And then when he arrives here, it was a momentous occasion. I would say that the Rhodesians helped to build his mystique and therefore profound significance as a new leader for Zimbabwe. The only time when coverage of Mugabe or ZANU-PF was deemed to be acceptable was when it was negative. In the little coverage that was published, he was routinely referred to as a terrorist leader. Despite constantly being branded a terrorist, Mugabe had the backing of the people. And come Zimbabwe's first democratic election in 1980, he became the country's first black prime minister. Given Mugabe's vilification in the Rhodesian media under Smith, he moved quickly to transform the Zimbabwean version. One of the main aims of, of uh, media policy after independence was, to use Mugabe's words, to decolonize uh, broadcasting and print media institutions. My fellow Zimbabweans. And it was really important for them to fight uh, media imperialism more broadly. So they decided to transform the national broadcaster and also to gain ownership over uh, the Rhodesia printing and publishing company that owned uh, the majority of newspaper titles during the Rhodesian era. The main Zimbabwean newspaper publishing company was actually controlled from South Africa. Their news coverage was sympathetic to white interests. So his first agenda was to seek to wrest that control from foreign ownership. The Nigerians helped us to buy the Zim papers from, from Argos Press, five million pounds. The Nigerians were part of the liberation struggle. They trained many of our fighters. So this would have been a continuation of that trend. It appeared imperative then that uh, the new government should have a media outlet. Apartheid was con 
condemned as inhuman. For the most part, Mugabe did not transform Zimbabwe's media, but instead adopted methods similar to his predecessors. The Rhodesian Broadcasting Corporation became the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, ZBC. The Rhodesian Herald became The Herald, Zimbabwe's most widely circulated newspaper. Both proved dependably loyal until last month's coup. But if there was one issue that would define Mugabe's approach to the media, it was land reform. In the 1990s, expropriating and redistributing white-owned farmland among black Zimbabweans helped Mugabe shore up his waning popularity. And as foreign journalists began to report on the story, Mugabe found a way to use the framing of it by the Western media, particularly the British media, to foster an us-and-them narrative that would serve him for years to come. You are not wanted to be here anymore. For the death of a white farmer over the weekend, the incident unfolded from about 6.30 local time here in Harare. The global media representation of the Zimbabwe crisis in the early 2000s was often presented as a racial conflict between white farmers and a, a black uh, government. Um, and this was helpful to the Zimbabwean government in many ways because it allowed them to prove that Britain was mainly interested in Zimbabwe because of the white population. So one would have expected a more balanced uh, view of the land reform as part of the decolonization process, but no. The media went wild, the British media in particular, and highlighted the atrocities against the whites more than th those against the black workers on those farms. So it became a spectacle to put in the front page of uh, British newspapers or uh, electronic media a white who has been battered or killed. As I recall having a conversation with a new news agency correspondent based in Harare, and he said, you know, if I supply a story to my editor that with a headline, white farmer killed by a violent black squatter, I'm on the wire. I'm going to have my story featured in the international press. So certainly um, the way in which race uh, plays, a, you know, played a part should not um, be under, uh, you know, underestimated. That white families were being kicked off their farms, often at gunpoint and without compensation, was a big news story. But Mugabe turned the international media fixation on that story against them, claiming they had a pro-colonial bias. Whether that was true or not, Mugabe exploited it. He banned news outlets like the BBC, calling its journalists agents sent by Britain to destabilise Zimbabwe, knowing that anti-imperialist messaging would resonate with voters and reinforce his leadership. Leave us alone. We are Zimbabweans, not Britons. If the foreign press had adopted an even-handed approach, comprehensively looking at each and every aspect of that problem, in order to present a fair and balanced dissemination of news, any photo here. They would undermine the president of Zimbabwe by removing the carpet from under his feet. Mugabe's relationship with the British media would become outwardly hostile. What have the British to do with Zimbabwe? Who are you? You bloody idiots. But in a way, symbiotic. Mugabe gave journalists an easy story to cover the cliché of an archetypal African dictator, and they in turn provided him with an easy target. Journalists, tell those you are representing that the Robert Mugabe is still here, well and strong. Allowing him to dust off his old anti-imperialist credentials to combat the international media, a tactic that would help the Zimbabwean leader survive for 37 years. Until now.